Good afternoon. We are so excited that you are here joining us for our Fairbanks Ethics Lecture. I am Robin Axel Adams. I am the manager of the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics. Um, as you walked in, we hope that you were, uh, took the minute to sign in. It helps us uh, keep track of our numbers, but then it also helps so that you will get um, CE and CME um, credit for this. And you will receive that um, in the next couple of weeks. I mistakenly um, said that last month that you don't get them to the end of the year, but you actually do get them um, pretty soon. What you don't get until the end of the year is our evaluation. So uh, make sure you sign, that, sign up for that. Um, the lecture is being recorded and broadcast today, and so it is so exciting um, as we continue to have our broadcast sites expand. Today we are welcoming these different IU health hospitals. We're welcoming Arnett and Ball, Blackford, Jay, North, and West. We also are welcoming the IU School of Dentistry, Reed Health, and the Peyton Manning Children's Hospital. Just as a reminder to silence all of your phones um, so that, that you are not um, disturbing with rings or whatever might, fun noise might come out of your phone, so please silence those. And uh, Dr. Leland has no relevant financial conflicts of interest. I also want to just point out to you that if you are at all interested in our fellowship, and our ethics fellowship, uh, we would invite you tomorrow to come right across the hall here to our Lunch and Learn. We are providing lunch. Um, it is Moe's, if you like that. Um, if nothing else, you can come to Moe's and just have a good time with us for a half an hour. But we will be um, doing the same presentation at 11.30, 12, and 12.30. If you cannot make that but are still interested in learning uh, what we said, we have that on our website. You can click on the website and, and listen to one of the recordings that Brian and I did yesterday. And um, if nothing else, you can also always contact Brian and I and find out more about the fellowship. We would love to sit down and talk with you about that. And we have a variety of fellows, uh, current and past, in the room if you'd like to grab one of them and ask them. So it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Brian Leland. Dr. Leland serves as the Fellowship Director for Clinical Ethics at the Charles Warren Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics, and then he also directs the program development at Riley Hospital for Children in Ethics. He's a board-certified pediatric critical care physician in the Division of Pediatric Critical Care Medicine. He completed his undergraduate medical school pediatric residency and his pediatric critical care fellowship throughout through Indiana University. Um, he's a little bit dangerous, so we don't let him out of the state. Um, Dr. Leland is a native of Indiana. He's a proud father, a proud husband. He's a proud father of two, a proud husband. And unfortunately, he is an IU, health, or an IU basketball fanatic. I am a Purdue basketball fernatic, so we, despite that, we are still friends. So it, if nothing else, it is my pleasure to welcome my friend and colleague, Brian Leland. I'm here today to talk to you about uh, ethical considerations surrounding uh, parental vaccination refusals, a hot button topic to say the very least. And um, I have, as Robin mentioned, no uh, financial or other conflicts of interest that I need to disclose to you. And while I don't have any of those types of disclosures, um, I do want to acknowledge a slight redirection here. So some of you may be saying, um, why Dr. Cox, who was uh, intended to present today, uh, how different you appear. Um, and to that I would reply, well, my responsibilities as Chief Medical Officer here at Riley have changed the slides. Um, <laughs> it's going well. All right, hold on. Okay, oh. Brilliant. Um, have taken a toll on me, specifically in the form of alopecia. So, um, I show you this slide. So about a year and a half ago, I gave a lecture in Evansville at Deaconess Hospital at their pediatric conference, just introduction to Peds Ethics 101, basically. And I said, um, the last slide was, you know, here are all these other things that um, you can invite me back to talk about. And I put in bold all of these different options and in tiny little print, because I didn't want to talk about it, put immunization mandates. And uh, of course, the results are in, and that's what they wanted to talk about. So um, as such, this lecture um, will focus on those aspects. Uh, they called my bluff. If you don't play poker, pocket seven twos, not a hand you will generally uh, win a lot of uh, bets on. So let's get into it. We'll talk about objectives here. We're going to explore the history of vaccination and then perceptions and social climate surrounding vaccine risks and benefits. We will utilize ethical principles to inform a framework for managing hesitancy and refusals. And then we will talk about what it looks like to navigate through an ethical framework and functionally facilitate patient care in the context of these um, refusals. 
So let's acknowledge up front that this is incredibly complex, delicate, nuanced, and that navigating these discussions uh, requires that we honor beliefs, practices, values of um, people that may very much differ from ourselves. And um, if everyone is coming here hoping to leave with the right answer about this, I invite you to leave now because that's not going to happen, okay? We're going to find ourselves in a position where um, there is not universally one right answer as a realistic outcome. So I put this slide in many of the presentations that I do because I think it is important and highlights that very phenomenon, which is <clears throat> um, ethics is the gray, right? This is not right and wrong, yes and no. That's the world of pick you in, more, in some respects, right? Which, which I adore, that safe place where, there's, where there are boundaries and, and um, gray is, is, is less present. But, but ethics um, it not only uh, lives in the gray, but it embraces the gray. And that's exactly how we're going to navigate today. Um, I also want to say that the topic of vaccination ethics is one that if we um, exhausted would be a five-day conference with several dozen lectures, okay? But today's um, uh, conversation is not going to focus um, overwhelmingly on policy or public health or research and development or, you know, global disease eradication programs, but rather um, how to navigate um, at the bedside these concepts or in the office for that matter. Okay, so um, as Robin Axel Adams mentioned, I am a board certified pediatrician and I hear all the time, um, you know, from people that um, whether they refuse to vaccinate or not are exhausted that vaccination continues to be such a discussed topic. And, and they say, you know, why can't pediatricians find something else to care about? Why is this the thing? Um, when you look up pediatrician in the Oxford Dictionary, it says a medical practitioner specializing in children and their diseases. Well, I break disease management into three components, prevention, treatment, and cure. And you, I'm sure you've heard this mantra that prevention is the best cure. Well, um, the current estimates are that every year there are three million lives saved secondary to vaccination practices in childhood. And if a pediatrician's job is to create an environment and facilitate care that best um, provides an opportunity for a child to thrive, I would argue that you'd be hard pressed to find a, an intervention that is, has a greater impact um, on that child's health. So that might be why we care so much. All right, let's look at history here. Anybody know who this is? Points will be awarded. Jenner. Hey, very nice. Okay, Dr. Schreiner. So this is Edward Jenner. Um, and he is credited with the, creating the very first vaccine, which was for? I hear whispers of something. But... Smallpox, great. Um, so he was a, a physician in the, in the UK back in the 18th century. And in 1970, or, or sorry, 1796, he created the first vaccine. How did he do this, you might ask? Well, he noticed that women who were affectionately called milkmaids, which their responsibility was for milking cows, never seemed to get smallpox. Well, at the time, there was a bovine version of smallpox, uh, affectionately called cowpox, and these women would contract cowpox and um, inherently uh, developed an immunity subsequently to smallpox. And so Jenner said, well, that's interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to, investigate that a little bit. And so he took a milkmaid who had um, boils on her hand that were cowpox. And cowpox is a much milder infection, usually um, localized, rarely systemic, but um, um, and rarely fatal for human beings. And he lanced one of those boils and he took the um, pus functionally and then um, inoculated a young boy with it. Okay, he took a lance and, and scraped his arm up and put this on him and the young boy developed cowpox. He then found a woman that was actively infected with smallpox, did the same thing, lanced one of her boils, took that um, pus and inoculated the boy and he did not develop smallpox. Um, speaking of uh, ethics, research ethics, I suspect that the IRB <laughs> would be unlikely to support this methodology, but um, in some respects, um, thank goodness he was right, okay? So, that's the first vaccine, and that's how it was created. 
let's look at some of the other um, important things in history. So in the early 1800s, Massachusetts was the first state to enact mandatory vaccination. And then in um, the 1820s, Britain did this universally. And then in the 1830s, not surprisingly, was the first major anti-vaccination movement. And we'll talk about that momentarily. Um, in the late 1800s, rabies vaccines were um, developed. And then in 1905 was the first time that um, there was a big U.S. Supreme Court case about this, and the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in favor of compulsory smallpox vaccination, much to the chagrin of the gentleman who was opposed. 1950s and then 1955, not 1950-55, um, the first polio vaccines were created. And then between 1960 and 1981, in the United States, individual states started um, requiring vaccination in order to enter public schools. In 1986, um, a, an act was um, formally created in the federal legislation called the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act. And you may hear someone who is hesitant or opposed to vaccination reference this act. And that's because within this act was the creation of something called the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, which says that if you are convinced that you were harmed by a vaccine, you can essentially submit a application or a, a petition you will be reviewed and if that's been determined to be correct then there is a fund of money and you will be compensated according with the degree of injury that you have um, and those who are opposed or hesitant say see this proves that it's a conspiracy and that they know it's not safe right um, what they don't know is that actually the reason for implementing this was that um, around this time as this um, as vaccination pushes were happening um, pharmaceutical companies and providers started to have a sentiment of, you know, people aren't that receptive to this. It's not lucrative. I'm not sure that we're going to, you know, uh, commit ourselves to this endeavor. And so this act actually occurred such that the infrastructure for vaccination could be sustained um, and these initiatives move forward. So it was, in fact, actually to help the individuals who were administering the, vaccin the vaccines and creating the vaccines to, to feel supported in doing so. Um, in the 1990s is the time that is considered to be the second major anti-vaccination movement. Um, and this was in conjunction with a growth in the uh, recommended number of vaccines um, from 1990 to 2006, going from seven to 14. So more exposure, more scrutiny, and there was uh, beginning to be the development of multi-vaccine injections, and people had questions or concerns about safety thereof. Um, I assume that everyone is uh, at least peripherally familiar with an article in 1998, which alleged that there was um, a, an association, or not an association, but that MR, MR, the MMR vaccine caused autism. Um, secondary to a component in vaccines called th thimerosal. I want to specifically say that um, that article has been retracted by every author except the lead author who continues to um, strongly advocate that this um, interaction is, is real and that there have been dozens of subsequent studies evaluating this unable to confirm um, this association and jumping back to that article the other authors acknowledged that there was bias and um, essentially inappropriate methodology to massage the the data to arrive at the conclusions that uh, ultimately came out of that article oh and then thimerosal was removed from vaccines not because it was identified as a problem but because um, it, it was ex essentially realized that the culture and perception of thimerosal containing vaccines had been so destroyed that the only way to move forward was to, to take it out. Okay, so just like vaccination has a long history, so too does an anti-vaccination sentiment or mistrust. And I told you that 1930 was the first major anti-vaccine movement. Um, well, I told you that the first vaccine was created in the late 1700s, right? Well, in 1790, the average life expectancy in the U.S. was 38 years old. So almost exactly a full life, um, a full lifespan, and then this movement moves forward. So this highlights, I think, one of the common challenges with vaccines, and that is that they are a victim of their own success. So as rates of these infections, of smallpox in particular in this case, um, drastically were reduced, people's familiarity with, concern for, fear of the real risk that they posed um, became more and more distant. And when something is not at, your, at the forefront of your mind, 
it becomes hard to prioritize it and or to accept risks associated with protecting from it, right? Um, this is a piece of propaganda that was um, promoted at that time, and this was um, a sentiment that if you allowed yourself or your loved ones to be in, inoculated with um, this cowpox um, vaccine, that you risked a side effect of essentially um, morphing or evolving into this um, human cow beast like um, person. My personal favorite is uh, the gentleman in the second row here with the inordinately large nose and the steer coming out of it as though it was a malignant tumor. Um, really impressive, right? So let's see here. Let's take a step back, though, and talk a little bit about social climate, OK? So I think we maybe um, are doing ourselves and our patients a disservice by generalizing things. And I've heard everything from these people are truly crazy to they are ignoring the truth that, that is clearly evident to at this point, it's not even about whether or not to vaccinate. It's just an attention grab. And I'm not convinced that uh, any of those are universally true. Um, and in fact, perhaps we should acknowledge that there are legitimate reasons to have concern about um, the vaccines and that if we honored those and explored those with patients, perhaps we could uh, more effectively communicate with them and uh, align with them in a way that we can actually get them vaccinated. Um, so I break this into questions of safety, questions of necessity, and questions of efficacy. Um, regarding safety, <clears throat> so I'm sure we've all heard someone say, I got the flu shot once and I got the flu as a result, so I'm never getting it again. Well, let's remember that the very first vaccine, you literally gave someone cowpox in order to protect them against smallpox, right? Um, and when you talk about safety, the, the method by which you did cowpox inoculation was barbaric. You literally uh, excoriated or um, eroded the skin barrier of someone's arm or leg or some body part in order to then take a suspension of the cowpox disease suspended in glycerin and either took a lance and lanced it into them or wiped it all over them. And they got a really impressive um, regional inflammatory reaction. Some of them developed systemic symptoms. Um, so, you know, I think if that was the current approach to vaccination, people might struggle even more. Um, regarding safety as well, in the early 1800s, there was um, an act passed in Congress called, I can't remember what it was called, but essentially it was an act to encourage um, vaccination and ensure that everyone had this resource available. And so they mandated that the U.S. Postal Service, free of charge, ship um, any materials or equipment necessary for smallpox vaccination. And unfortunately, there was a mix up and a large shipment of actual smallpox was delivered and um, several people died as a result of being inoculated with smallpox rather than cowpox. So the history is not in our favor when we talk about um, vaccine safety, right? Um, we talked a little bit about autism. And then I think the other thing is maybe we downplay inappropriately the rare but real side effects of current vaccinations, right? So um, I think most families here, oh, you might have some redness. Maybe they'll be a little tender that you can give them some Tylenol, maybe a low-grade fever, period. Well, the polio vaccine can cause flaccid paralysis. Other vaccines can cause encephalopathy, seizures. I'm not sure we do a good enough job acknowledging that while these risks are um, rare, that they are real and some side effects can be significant, right? Um, and what a brilliant way to reinforce with someone that we're hiding something from them if we aren't forthcoming about that. Um, uh, regarding necessity, so as I mentioned earlier, people have a hard time prioritizing something that isn't um, right in front of them. And infectious diseases were surpassed by, I think, cancer and heart disease in the 1920s as the leading cause of death worldwide. Um, and, or in the United States, pardon me. Um, and so these previously very common diseases that people had an appreciation for just how devastating they could be as they become more rare slash non-existent, um, people are less inclined to be concerned about the outcomes of if they were to contract this very uncommon disease, right? Um, I will say that there's no question, though, that it is necessary. So individuals who are not vaccinated in um, childhood who go to school um, have a 22 to 35 percent um, increased risk of, of contracting measles and a five to nine percent, uh, five to nine times increased risk of contracting diphtheria, for example, or pardon me, pertussis, pertussis. All right, so what about efficacy? Well, I think this is an important one to think about what 
viewpoint or perspective are you coming um, at this question from? So let's say we look at polio. Well, in 1988, there were 350,000 cases of polio worldwide. And in 2018, there were 33. So does it work? Yeah, it does. Absolutely. Okay, but let's, on the flip side, take the flu vaccine, which is notorious for requiring very um, intricate algorithms and, and functionally an estimated guess on which strains are going to proliferate that flu season, what are we going to put in the vaccine. I looked up the 2018 um, influenza vaccine efficacy and it was 47%. Now, if I'm someone who isn't really keen to vaccinate and I say, you're telling me that there's a one in two chance that if I Get the, if I expose my child to the risk of these vac this vaccine, that it isn't going to do anything at all for them if they're exposed, I'm, nope, not interested in that, right? But on the flip side, as a pediatric intensivist, I think of a child who got influenza, got superimposed, necrotizing pneumonia, and is now on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation support, and I say, you're telling me there's a one in two chance that they, that they wouldn't get that sick? Uh, sign me up yesterday, okay? So... Um, really important that we acknowledge that the perspective and the lens by which you view this informs how you um, uh, prioritize these percentages and what it means for a vaccine to be efficacious. Um, we also hear all the time that, well, uh, fundamentally this is just an imposition on my civil liberties and it is my right to make this decision for my child. And I will reference my dear friend and colleague Jane Hartzok, who this is her soapbox and I love this. And she says, you know, people are misinformed and it is not their right. The right belongs to the child. It's the child's right to have someone, a surrogate, making decisions that serve their best interest. And so in fact, the surrogate has a responsibility not a right. Okay, something that seems to be growing as well is the idea of, well, I don't like vaccination, but I'm willing to entertain it, but I want to do a delayed or alternative schedule. And concerns and reasons for this come from, uh, as I referenced, this, the multi-disease vaccines and concerns that, well, exposing people to multiple will overwhelm their immune system and compromise it or make it so that if they were exposed to another infection just in their day-to-day -day ongoings, that they wouldn't be able to fight it. I hope I can reassure you in saying that they looked at um, this in lab studies and the current estimate is that you could be vaccinated with 3,200 diseases simultaneously and have no compromise in your immune system whatsoever. I'm not, I don't think we do 3,200 yet, so. Um, so problems with this approach though are significant. So there is no evidence-based alternative schedule and many of them, and there are hundreds if not thousands. You Google alternative vaccine schedule and it's like everyone and their mother has their own alternative vaccine schedule. And many of them recommend skipping doses of a, a relative vaccine entirely. Um, and importantly, I think people underappreciate that um, severity of illness or risk of death from an infectious disease is not um, stagnant through life. Young children and older adults are much more likely to be seriously, um, become seriously sick or die as a result of um, contracting an infectious disease. So when we, uh, an alternative schedule is adopted that, let's say, um, requires to age 11 instead of age 2, you uh, increase the risk in that young child population as they are suboptimally vaccinated. Um, if there's a silver lining, any vaccination is better than none. Please do not take that as an endorsement for alternative scheduling. Oh, and just of note, there is, um, I think it's on the CDC website, there is a recommended alternative um, vaccine schedule um, made available for people who have a medical indication for um, modification to the, the current schedule recommendations. All right, so we talked about the history and the social context, and now let's look at some ethical principles, I think, that are pertinent to how we evaluate um, refusals and hesitancy. So I identified this list, and we'll um, race through these, and then the ones that I think are most pertinent we'll talk about in more detail. So beneficence says, um, I'm going to do net good for this patient. Non-maleficence, which I always used to pronounce as non-malfeasance, that is incorrect, um, is if I'm going to do everything I can to avoid harm. First, do no harm, right? Um, autonomy, which says that someone who is competent with decision-making capacity is allowed to make bad decisions, can direct their medical care even um, against our recommendations. But young babies don't have autonomy. 
And if they were adolescents, we talk about something called emerging autonomy, which means they should participate in the decisions. Um, but when you don't even have emerging autonomy functionally, we talk about future autonomy, which means we want to protect your um, opportunities to reach an autonomous future where you can direct your care, right? One of the challenges with this framework is that um, you can't unvaccinate a patient after they're vaccinated unless, is John Christensen in here? I'm, as far as I know, you cannot unvaccinate a patient. Um, and so we have to acknowledge that someone may in adulthood say, I wish that had never have happened. I would encourage you not to let that uh, keep you from vaccinating. Um, patient best interest, which essentially says we're going to make decisions that are in that child's best interest. The harm principle, which provides a framework for saying if something is going to place a child at uh, substantial risk of serious harm, I'm not obligated to honor a demand or a refusal of that therapy by a surrogate. Um, and then the concept of benevolent persuasion, which essentially says um, through effective communication, I can help someone arrive at a different conclusion in this case, obviously, um, about whether or not to vaccinate. Okay, so we've gone through all this. The data is pretty clear. I'm sure some of you are like, okay, well, we're right, they're wrong. Let's, let's make it happen, right? <clears throat> um, well, what does that look like? Well, that's a vaccine mandate. And what's the framework for that? Well, the framework says that these are premised on, is, it, is the mandate reasonable when you do a risk-benefit balance? And is the degree of intrusion into someone's autonomy, or in this case, a parental authority, um, appropriate? And is there some component of a public health necessity? Um, this is a quote out of the um, court case that I mentioned to you in 1905, where they upheld that this gentleman required smallpox vaccination. The liberty secured by the Constitution of the United States to every person within its jurisdiction does not import an absolute right in each person to be, at all times and in all circumstances, wholly free from restraint. There are manifold restraints to which every person is necessarily subject for the common good. For those American, true Americans in here, sorry, I didn't capitalize United States. Okay. You might wonder, what does the vaccine schedule look like for Indiana? And vaccination mandates are state by state, so they vary um, pretty significantly. But here is the Indiana required and recommended school immunizations. And as you can see, it's not, it's not small. <clears throat> I think mandates acknowledge, as we talked about this public health phenomenon, um, that a decision to vaccinate your child affects more than just your child. Okay, and there's good evidence that says there are um, greatly increased frequencies of vaccine preventable illness outbreaks in the communities that have the highest rates of vaccine of non vaccination, uh, whatever mechanism that is through. Um, and we have to acknowledge that although you are vaccinated, that doesn't definitively mean you can't contract the disease. What it definitively means is that you should have a drastically reduced severity of illness unless you have like some undiagnosed immunocompromised state or something. Um, and this highlights the importance of considering justice. You know, are we sharing the risks and benefits of um, vaccination amongst those who do and, and don't vaccinate? So let's do a pro and con for vaccination mandates, okay? So the pro says, we know it works. We know vaccinating works. So this is protecting child health. Um, it ensures justice in society, okay? So there is this um, growing term, which is not politically correct, that you will see in some of the ethics literature that describes individuals who elect, not have a medical indication, but elect not to vaccinate um, their children, but then benefit from others vaccinating. We call that herd immunity, right? Um, we call, they're, they're called freeloaders. So, so they, 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 were, they benefit without sharing in any of the risks of, of vaccinating. And not only do they benefit, but they um, place others at risk as a result of that decision. <clears throat> um, we know that vaccinating benefits the individual and the group, herd immunity. And then vaccination mandates work. I put sometimes here for a reason, and I'll talk about that momentarily. Um, so let's talk about the cons. Um, again, there's a sentiment of this is government intrusion on parental decision making. And you know, there, that is not an incorrect statement. We provide a huge amount of leeway to parents to um, uh, instill values and um, parental practices that they think are important and they vary widely. So I want my child to, to go to Sunday school. No, you, you shouldn't expose your child to any faith practice until they have an opportunity to evaluate that on their own. Um, or I want to send my kid to, to private school or public school, or I'm choosing to live closer to work even though I know the school system is not as good, right? Um, others say this undermines parental autonomy. This is my soapbox. There is no such thing. 
you will see it in the literature, it is, it is a farce. So autonomy by definition refers to self-rule. There is no such thing as self-rule on behalf of another. So really what we need to be saying is, um, is parental authority. And authority by definition is not absolute. So instead, I'll flip sides for a second. I would redefine this to say this upholds appropriate limitations to parental authority, in which case I would put it in the pro category. Okay. Um, and then um, this is re in regards to the they work sometimes. So there is a pretty decent evidence base that says you have to be careful with mandates because there will be a small population who otherwise were ambivalent and probably could have been um, persuaded into making a decision that was consistent with your recommendation that because it has been mandated out of opposition to the mandate alone now become an adversary. Um, I think I put the Mr. Yuck sticker up here because I hate parental autonomy as a term, but I remember Mr. Yuck when I was a kid because it was this huge push and everyone, all parents were to put Mr. Yuck stickers on, you know, alcohol and bug spray and cleaning solutions because this was a way to communicate to either nonverbal or those who couldn't read, like, stay away, danger. Well, turns out kids love Mr. Yuck. And, <laughs> and so uh, talk about your all-time backfires. <clears throat> All right, so we, we went through this, um, con the concept of mandates, but as I mentioned to you, mandates, one, are state by state and variable, and two, um, as they currently exist, are specific to entry into school, okay? And so that's great. You know, Timmy and Jenny are now vaccinated because they're going to go to school, so mom did it last minute, but what about baby? Um, and there are waivers for these mandates, and... Um, the majority of the, every state has a um, medically contraindicated to vaccination waiver. Um, 18 states, however, have a non-medical waiver, which is either um, religious grounds or some of them even are as, um, I'll use the word generic, as strong personal preference against. Okay, and Indiana is one of the 18 states. So now we have Tammy and Jenny who have waivers and the baby's not vaccinated, right? So what do we do in that context? How are we supposed to navigate these conversations with these families? Well, I think we look at how, how are surrogates supposed to arrive at decisions. And the gold standard for surrogate decision making in pediatric is patient best interest. And this says that I'm making a decision that I genuinely believe with conviction uh, is in the best interest of my child. Now, needless to say, in the context of vaccination um, refusal, and since that's what we're talking about, um, there are big challenges with that, right? Because there can be differences of opinion, and we just went through how families are, um, and parents in particular, are supported in using values-based judgments to help um, rear their child and nurture them. And so that uh, results in there being uh, oftentimes discrepancies, and what are we supposed to do in that context? Well, first and foremost, I would like to argue that patient best interest is not exclusively a surrogate decision-making practice, but one that a medical provider is responsible for as well, and a shared decision is ultimately the best approach to this type of phenomenon, where the medical provider with the expertise shares the importance and the value and numbers and makes a recommendation um, based on evidence and then navigates with a family and their values to come to a decision. So, but let's just say, doesn't matter what you do, there's gonna be some um, situations that they refuse no matter what. Are there contexts where we could say, well, we need to override and we need to forcefully administer vaccines. And I don't mean forcefully like hold the child down, but um, override the parent or the surrogate. So as it currently stands, these are some frameworks that um, have been used in the past historically to support or navigate um, overriding a refusal of, of therapy. So child abuse or neglect is a good one, right? And so what might be an example of that? Well, if a child's immunocompromised but is eligible for vaccination, I would argue that that could, could well rise to the, the level of abuse or neglect because we know what would ha happen and what would be implicated if they were to be infected. Um, the harm principle. So the harm principle, as I mentioned, says substantial risk of serious harm. You're not obligated as a provider to honor a request or a refusal. Um, the harm principle is a really challenging framework to uphold um, overriding surrogate 
refusal of vaccination in our current culture because of how effective herd immunity is. And so the likelihood that they would develop and uh, contract an infection while it is substantially more than an otherwise vaccinated child is still very small. And the less likely it is to occur, the heavier the weight for um, the risk of vaccinating in the first place, okay? And so um, I would propose to you that outside of extenuating circumstances, which would be like an emergency setting, an epidemic, a pandemic, an immunocompromised child, that the harm principle would be difficult to apply definitively um, as an approach to overriding vaccination hesitancy or refusal. <clears throat> um, but if it doesn't apply to, if it doesn't fall within one of these, how do we evaluate it? Well, you use a burden benefit analysis, right? So I look at three general scenarios, one where, <clears throat> pardon me, where the burden of the therapy is very low and the outcome um, is likely to be good, okay? It may, be, it may well be appropriate to override in that circumstance. Another is, and these are generically speaking, um, where the therapy that's recommended is highly burdensome and a good outcome is unlikely. It'd certainly be inappropriate to override in those circumstances. Um, and then when you are in the heart of the gray, moderate burden and intermediate um, chance of a good outcome, I encourage you to invite us to participate in those conversations with you. I think that you can generate arguments and frameworks to support the first and third in these uh, regarding vaccination hesitancy and refusal for the reasons that we discussed previously. Okay. I know no one's, apparently their brain can't work for more than 30 seconds at a time, or 30 minutes at a time, but without a break, so I'm gonna tell you an awesome story. Um, these are my boys. Lucas Paul is gonna be five on Saturday. It's gonna be a big day if we're going to Pinheads. Um, <laughs> and, and then the moose next to him is JJ. He's gonna be 11 months old um, in, a, in a couple days. So um, last summer, we were at a pool, and for reasons I can't remember, I was telling Lucas how Leland men all look the same. and. Um, and I was telling him, you know, uh, gr Grandpa, I look just like Grandpa, and you look just like me. And, and he said, well, well th that doesn't make any sense because Grandpa doesn't have any hair, and, and I have a lot of hair. <laughs> and, and I am standing in the pool, and he's like up on the, uh, up on the side, and I, I, for reasons that make no sense, I said, well, what about me? <clears throat> and Lucas, you know, well, um, you have medium hair. <laughs> And, and I was excited about this, so I, turned, I, right? so I turned to my wife and I was like, you are so lucky to be married to a good looking guy with medium hair. And, and of course my wife, who is incredibly witty, goes, yeah, for now. <laughs> so, and uh, ironically, I didn't know he was gonna be here, but my father has joined us today and I'm sorry to inform you that you have no hair. <laughs> All right, so. Um, Let's talk about how we actually facilitate patient care in this challenging um, clinical context. So I've presented you information that says historical data and foundational ethical principles support that vaccination should be pursued, right? We know there is benefit. Um, we feel strongly that the risks are, are outweighed by the benefits. Um, however, those frameworks also uh, with with some exceptions that we went through, um, may not support universally appropriateness of unilateral override of vaccination refusal. Um, so if they should, but they won't, then what are we supposed to do? Well, the academic answer is you do these things to combat anti-vaccination. You research and disseminate vaccine safety um, information. You maintain and improve monitoring programs so that you can have more data to share with people. You empower providers and parents and you give them info that counters misperceptions. Um, you promote public education. Pardon me. Um, I love this quote because I think that it defines what's necessary um, to definitively um, combat anti-vaccination. And it says, society must recognize that science is not a democracy in which the side with the most vote or the loudest voices determines what is right. So if you can't force them to do it, then, then what? So I will offer three different frameworks for how you might navigate this. And I would argue that each of these um, can be defended using ethical principles and terms. Um, although I would uh, suggest that one is preferable over the other two. 
So the first is you can decline to care for patients um, and their families who don't vaccinate. What might be ways to think through how to support that? Well, um, this is an evidence-based practice, and this is a physician's um, reinforcing a commitment to that practice. Um, there are those who feel like allowing someone not to vaccinate is the same as supporting them not vaccinating. Um, there might be a provider that says, I, I, I simply cannot accept the uh, inherent risk to my other patients who are choosing to um, embrace this evidence-based practice by allowing someone who doesn't um, to, to be around them or be part of this patient pool. Um, it upholds the principle of justice, right? So it is um, uh, fair and equitable distribution of the risks and benefits of what it looks like to vaccinate an individual. Um, while I don't think this is a great, um, there's merit to this, I have certainly read and heard that there are individual providers who would say, you know, I'm afraid that if they get measles or pertussis and have a bad outcome that that parent may come to me and say, well, if you would only explain just how serious this could have been, I absolutely would have vaccinated. And now they're worried about, um, you know, being pursued legally. Um, I think for me, the biggest um, reinforcing factor is this last one, which is if a pediatrician feels like this is the most important thing they can do and there is an irreconcilable difference in the philosophy of approach to care, and it's gonna compromise further care and ability to communicate effectively um, moving forward, then that actually is to the detriment of the patient, and it would be appropriate then to transition that patient's care. Um, those who don't like this approach say, well, that's abandonment. And I would say it absolutely could be, and that would be ethically indefensible, that you would need to establish an approach where um, you have a, a transition process, not a, oh, you don't want to vaccinate, never come back. <clears throat> um, others would say, well, this just further erodes trust in a, in a family or a, a surrogate who already was skeptical or questioning the healthcare system. Um, I will acknowledge that um, declining to care for non-vaccinators um, is inconsistent with the AAP and the CDC policy statements. Now, they don't explicitly say you are not permitted to they, they say, we do not recommend that, that, that you do so. Um, and I think an important one is you miss future opportunities for ongoing conversations where maybe you could benevolently persuade them um, to arrive at a different decision. And then I also think importantly, the child is not the one that has made this decision and they are the one that, that arguably suffers if that patient's care is transitioned to someone who is openly embracing of um, not vaccinating. So what's option two? Option two is you give up or you let it go, right? So that's saying, okay, I, I, am, I feel strongly that you're wrong, but I can see this is never gonna change. I will never bring it up again. I'm gonna work to uh, maximize the therapeutic relationship with this family and every other aspect of the care of this patient. Absolutely reasonable. I recommend option three, um, which is benevolent persuasion and trust building to arrive to have effective communication and um, there are good reasons for this so while people get frustrated and they feel like those who don't want to vaccinate are hesitant uh, that it's a done deal before they even have a conversation the data says otherwise and it demonstrates that healthcare providers are the primary source of information about vaccines and that they do have influence over that decision um, importantly and i worry sometimes undervalued in the current culture of medicine that we have um, there is great evidence that says family members value the communication skills and empathic interactions of their provider at least as much, if not more, than their clinical acumen, okay? Um, and as such, effective communication is gonna be key. And so I am going to <clears throat> walk you through um, a model that actually doctors Torkey, Boschel, and Helft and I put out a few years ago that actually we did so as a novel approach to navigating futility disputes at the end of life. Um, but I think it is very applicable here because at the end of the day, um, uh, this is a futility dispute, right? It is a, I don't think I, I wanna do this. I think you absolutely should. And how do you work through a process like that? So here's the uh, old model of communication vastly oversimplified. I'm a provider. I have really important information to share with you. I do so. You're a rational human being. You process it. You arrive at the conclusions that are consistent with the recommendations that I make. Yeah, you wish. So I would offer instead that the medical encounter needs to be dissected a little bit more and that there are two communicative components. 
The first is informational communication, okay, which is exchange of data points. So it's what you have to say. It's the who, what, when, where, why, right? But then there's also relational communication, which is those uh, is is the art of medicine, right? The nonverbal communication, the ability to be empathic, be vulnerable with someone, listen. Um, and in order to effectively communicate, you have to successfully achieve both of these functions. <clears throat> so in a little bit more detail, so informational communication, that's vital signs, lab results, imaging, medications, articles about efficacy of vaccination, right? Um, but then there's relational communication, and this is where you establish trust. And if they don't trust in the information that you're telling them, then they're not going to even consider adopting or using it to arrive at a decision. I will read you this quote because I think it beautifully communicates this concept, and it says, <clears throat> caring and communicating are inseparably linked. You cannot hope to communicate effectively if you do not care about the person on the receiving end. And I would even evolve that a little bit more to say, you cannot hope to communicate effectively if they don't believe that you care about them. Okay? You caring about them isn't the same thing as them believing and trusting that you do. Okay? And that that's why you're making this recommendation that maybe they're uncomfortable with. Okay, so what does this look like in a, in a graphic? So we have an important issue to address vaccinations and ineffective communication means I can only accomplish one of these two things. So if I provide informational communication but don't accomplish relational communication, that is um, the physician who walks in and is like, hey, welcome, do a quick exam. Looks like you're here for your two month vaccines. Oh, I may have a little bit of fever, nothing to worry about. See you in six weeks. Oh, well, I have some questions. No, you don't, I got other people to see, but I will see you in six weeks. I don't, I don't trust that doc at all, right? I'm, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm hesitant, if I was hesitant before, I'm more hesitant now. <clears throat> so, they, so knowledge was shared, but there was no understanding created. So on the flip side, <clears throat> you can't just communicate relationally and not informationally and, and hope to, to move forward. So um, I universally think in this um, context of, and I can't remember if it was three years ago or eight years ago, there were these awesome commercials for Holiday Inn Express. And one of them was like a professional basketball game going on and one of the players pulls a hammy and outruns this trainer onto the court with his, you know, um, official badge on or whatever and like grabs this guy's leg and he's like, oh man, this is bad. I am so sorry that you're dealing with this, but don't worry. Don't worry, we're gonna get through this together. I'll be with you every step of the way. And the player is like, man, I am so glad that you are my doctor. And the guy goes, oh, oh, I'm not a doctor, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Um, and, the, and this was only um, exceptionally hilarious to me because as I was giving this little example down in, in Deaconess a couple months ago, I realized that they had put me up in a Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> Fantastic, right? Um, okay, so. Um, if you relate, if, you, if they can have a relational understanding but don't understand the information, then you similarly can't effectively communicate. Um, so you got to accomplish both. And what accomplishing both means is that they trust in, the, trust in you and why you are telling them this. And as such, there can be a, knowledge can be effectively shared and then you can effectively communicate. Now this is beautiful, right? But again, there, there is going to be a small subset of the population that no matter how perfect your communication skills and strategies are, it's going to be, you will not arrive at the outcome that you hope for, okay? Which I will take you all the way back to the first slide. A single right answer is not a realistic outcome, okay? All right, so um, what might be some tools that you can use to accomplish this um, informational and relational communication? So we use a couple of mnemonics, and I'll uh, let you read these, but the one that I love is uh, the nurse mnemonic, and that stands for name the emotion, voice understanding, um, communicate respect, offer a statement of support, and then explore. And so that might look like, I can see that you're frustrated that I insist on talking with you about this every visit. Um, I understand why this makes you angry. I can tell that unequivocally you are trying to make decisions that are in the best interest of your child and for your family. Um, I'm going to be here with you as we walk through these conversations each and every time. I was wondering if we could explore where some of the information that you got about autism and the MMR vaccine came from. Man, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> 
man, I'm good. All right. All right, Spikes is another one that I won't go through, but you're welcome to read. Um, <clears throat> so let's wrap up, and then I'll have exactly 10 minutes for questions. Perfect. So vaccination and vaccination hesitancy and refusals are longstanding issues, right? These aren't going anywhere anytime soon. Um, mandates are state variable, and um, I wanted to put this in here as a clarification. Some people say they, uh, you know, impinge on your freedoms. They don't, but they do restrict opportunities. Like if you want to send your kid to public school, they have to have this, okay? Um, and they are generally effective. Vaccination refusals, with the exceptions that we discussed, probably don't reach ethical thresholds in a blanket statement for surrogate override for intervention. Um, and while dismissal of vaccine refusal and um, deciding never to discuss it with them again is permissible, I don't think it's the best option. Um, and then lastly, effective communication and trust building is going to be imperative in these types of challenging conversations. I think that is my last slide, and I would be pleased to have any questions. Oh, and if you are viewing remotely, um, you may text your questions to the number on the screen. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I assume there are ex or recovering anti-vaxxers out there, you know, people that change their mind. Have there been any studies of, about how that process happened for individuals where they went from being opposed to it to embracing it? Um, the short answer is I do not know. That isn't something that I had a chance to, to delve into too much. Um, for sure, I agree that there, there is that population. I just don't know um, what type of um, investigations have been done to evaluate what that transition process looked like for them. Um, but the, the only caveat to that being the one population I can reference is um, children who have grown to adulthood and the moment that they turn 18 say, this was ridiculous, I'm getting all my vaccines. But, but I don't think that that reflects a change of heart, but rather um, an inability to move forward with vaccination until they were legally um, entitled to make that decision. So I have a question that's related to this. It's come up uh, with my students, and that is, what do you do with the adolescent who wants an HPV vaccine whose parents won't consent? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's ironic that you would ask because I just um, I had a conversation with Susan Hickman, who is um, one of the attorneys that works with IU Health at the State House with legislation, and I know that they were working to update language in one of the articles um, about um, preventative um, sexually transmitted disease and pregnancy um, options for adolescents. And as I understand, um, that bill went nowhere, but um, I was cautiously optimistic that that HPV vaccination would fall within the STD preventative um, therapies that adolescents would be um, permitted to consent to. Um, I would say, I think you struggle through conversations in the fashion that I just described using that model with um, those patients and their parents. I, I, I don't feel like I can stand up here and say, do it secretively without the parents' knowledge, as much as I honestly would love to tell you that. You can go to the Medical History Museum over there by Central State, up in the second floor library, they have a big, oh, excuse me, of course people usually can hear my voice, my mother complains about that still, um, a big glass case of I don't know, I'm guessing it's from the 50s or so of all, I'd say between 50 and 100 different antitoxins, vaccines, uh, anti-serum stuff uh, that, uh, so I forgot the company that had that, but it's something you may want to look at. Of course, you've probably never been to the Medical History Museum, but maybe this will enc encourage you to go. It will indeed. Where is this? Over by the old Central State Hospital on, you know, Washington and Tibbs. Oh, okay. Where we used to house about 5,000 people with intellectual disabilities, uh, and maybe about a fourth of the people were. That will be a different lecture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions that I can uh, try to address? Brian, that was really great. Um, I wonder if the anti vax conspiracy theories have caused us to miscalculate and misrepresent the actual risk-benefit ratio 
of, of this intervention among children um, in that, I mean, you, 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 you know, skillfully went through the sort of column of risks and the column of benefits, but I, th I think that that conversation over a couple of decades has caused us to misestimate them in a way that alters the ratio in an important way. I mean, there's an overwhelming amount of evidence that the risk-benefit ratio is favorable to children. I mean, vaccines are arguably the most important medical intervention ever invented in the human species. Couldn't agree. And so more. I just wonder if we if we're not having that conversation properly in our own circles. Yeah, I think I'll respond to that by saying I think we're having the conversation in our circles, but that um, those who have those conversations don't feel like the current political climate or recent past or recent or likely future will support uh, meaningful action to uh, allow those conversations to go anywhere. I was at ASBH, which is American Society for Bioethics and Humanities um, annual conference, and one of the, I would argue, considered a national leader in pediatric ethics, um, gave a presentation about um, vaccine refusal, and, and I quote, you know, at the end of the day, I'm just not going there when it came to um, really trying to push for, actually, let's establish legislation that says this is nonsensical that we are allowing families to refuse. What evidence do you have that in, in, in your compromise host that the vaccinations work? So the question was, what evidence do you have that in an immunocompromised host vaccinations work? So I would say, um, I, I can't reference evidence right now that there is good, ep or there is um, a, a pretty strong understanding that there is a, surely a suboptimal response, but that there may be some response and some is better than none. And, and obviously, depending on what, what the immunocompromised state um, is, whether it is an inherent genetic one or sec secondary to you know, chemotherapy that is a transient uh, suppression. Wonderful. If you uh, were hesitant or refused to ask a question in the large group, I will be up here. <laughs> Have a good day.